All right, everybody. I'm joined by Erica C. Barnett, editor editor of publiccola.com. How are you today? I'm great, Omari. How are you? I'm okay. As usual, I was reading your website, publiccola.com, and I came across this. Renton City Council to Homeless. No room at the end. Tell us all about it. The Renton City Council um, has uh, has voted overwhelmingly to kick out a bunch of um, unsheltered people, about 235, that are living in the Red Lion right now. Um, and they're going to do that in two stages. Um, they are going to have to reduce that population to 125 in uh, at the beginning of next June. And then next December, a year from now, everybody has to be out. And the way they did this is through a zoning law that essentially says um, a homeless shelter is not allowed in this zone. So um, that's the that's the top line. They also adopted some legislation that's going to make it really hard for shelters to set up elsewhere in Renton and is going to limit the number of people they can serve to a total of 100. Right. And now what brought this about in, in the Renton City Council? What was the catalyst behind this legislation? Well, the Renton uh, City Council and a lot of uh, homeowners, businesses um, in the area have really not wanted this uh, this shelter to be there in the first place. It the people came in uh, last year, right near the beginning of, or sorry, earlier this year at the beginning of the pandemic, um, because they were living at the Morrison Hotel in downtown Seattle, which is a really really crowded um, shelter. It was a really crowded shelter where people kind of stayed in bunks, like right on top of each other. And, um, and so they had to move because of COVID. Uh, it, it was sort of done in an emergency way because it's an emergency. King County moved them out there. And um, a lot of folks in Renton have been trying to get them out ever since. Um, there's litigation that's ongoing right now, um, separate from this whole legislation question where uh, they're trying to claim that this is an illegal zone issue, um, that it's not allowed under the zoning. I think the, the legislation kind of circumvents that, but, um, but yeah, I mean, this is an ongoing battle and this is just the latest volley. And I actually don't think it's going to be the last one either. Right. And does does any of this also, I, I know this is the, the catalyst you said was a red line, but there's been an ongoing discussion around homeless homelessness and homeless shelters across King County. I know that Executive Constantine, actually last time we, we actually talked, was the executive wanted to, to have like a regional approach to homelessness but some of the cities opted out by taking advantage of a, a law about taxing, a taxation law, some of everything else. What's the vibe that you're getting from some of the other cities in, across, around King County, especially the ones that border Seattle when it comes to the homelessness issue? Well, I think that Renton's a really good example. It's one of those cities, I think there were seven or so in all that opted out of the homelessness tax that the county passed. And that tax is, is basically a sales tax that's gonna pay for um, housing for people with essentially no income who are who are homeless. Um, and, um, and a lot of the cities said, we don't wanna participate in that. They passed their own taxes. In Renton, it's gonna pay, and actually in several other cities, it's gonna pay for housing for people making up to 80% of median income, which is not homeless people. It's, you know, it's almost middle income people in the Seattle area. I mean, you know, a lot of people we know and possibly, uh, I, you know, I would qualify for some of this stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a way of saying, you know, we're opting out and we don't agree with this regional approach. Um, and I think it really bodes poorly for um, for a truly regional approach where everybody's kind of on the same page with what they're going to do about homelessness. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, this is this is not even sub-regional. This is cities going their own way. Right. And do, do a lot of cities feel like, hey, we don't really have our own homeless problem. We're just getting overflow from Seattle. And that's why they feel they're going their own way. And if that is the case, um, you know, with this rent moratorium and a lot of other, a lot of people are not homeless right now because of things subsidizing them, you know, or, mm -hmm. or moratoriums in place. Do you think that some of these suburban cities might be hit with their homegrown homelessness soon? Well, I think that, and this is one of the things that kind of got me most frustrated when I was watching and live tweeting the meeting, there's this sense that this is a Seattle problem. But the reason people are in Seattle who become homeless in other places is because this is where you can actually get services because we don't have things like zoning rules that, you know, prohibit homeless shelters and things like that. In fact, we don't zone that stuff at all. Um, there's a lot of services here. And so when people say that Seattle is a magnet, what it really means is that we're a magnet for 
cities that don't offer anything to the people who become homeless there. So people who become homeless in Renton often end up in downtown Seattle because they can get food, because they can get shelter. So I think it's totally a misnomer. And when you look at surveys of people every year, you know, about where they came from, most of the people in Seattle came from King County and they did not all come from Seattle. So I, I think that um, the idea of thinking about this as a regional problem is, is really, you know, let's not just think of it as something we all need to solve, but also a problem that every single city in this region deals with. It's just that Seattle, you know, because we're the big city, because we're the ones with the tax base and we tend to have a more liberal population, maybe, you know, we, we offer the services. And so, um, so when I hear people saying, when I heard people saying last night, you know, this is something Seattle's dumping on us. People kept saying, you know, these people aren't our problem. They don't, they didn't come from here. Well, they absolutely did. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's just a real uh, misunderstanding of how homelessness works and, and a misunderstanding of the fact that it is not just a city problem. You're right about that in a sense. Actually, when I think about it, there's quite a few homeless people, transitional people that, uh, this summer, I've spent a a lot more time since this summer and even now, and even covering what's going on up there at Cal Anderson Park and the proposed sweep tomorrow. I talked to a lot of those people. They really, a lot of them are from suburban cities in King County, and they've come into the city because they know that they can get some kind of refuge or some kind of shelter. Um, And so maybe perhaps looking at this issue as Seattle is the place where a lot of people migrate to, as opposed to Seattle pushing their homeless onto other cities, uh, might be a more realistic perspective around the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it, in the same way that, you know, if you look at um, youth homelessness, a lot of times it's youth coming from places where they don't feel welcome for various reasons because of their identity. Um, you know, they were kicked out of homes uh, that, you know, are not accepting. I mean, all kinds of reasons that people become homeless. And and they do tend to end up in cities because cities, you know, in addition to offering services, tend to be places where people can find community, you know, even if it's not like an ideal community because you're still, you know, in, in a community of people who are who are homeless and struggling, um, you know, there, there are reasons that people end up in Seattle. And it's not just that Seattle somehow magically produces homelessness and suburban cities don't. Right. Now, taking it back to, to this particular red lion there in Renton, the flip side of the issue People would say, hey, you know what? Red Line was just sitting here, became a homeless shelter, 911 calls, doubled or tripled there, you know, medic one calls, incidents of X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, it, it, how did the, the, the sheltering agency, what was their defense around this? Or did they come with a plan to, to be able to manage? I know people kind of haphazardly around the pandemic came into one place. But that was some of the response that I saw on the resident side when I was looking at comments. Yeah, I mean, I think the response from the um, from the agency, which is the Downtown Emergency Service Center, has been that the um, the number of, I mean, yes, that in Renton, the number of nine one one calls and medic responses and things like that has increased because they have not been, um, you know, sheltering this population before. Um, the response from the agency has been that the number of 911 calls and medic responses and all that to this population has dramatically decreased to these, you know, particular people who are staying in a place where they have private rooms, where they have a door that locks, where they can take a shower, where they can sleep without being afraid that someone is going to steal all their stuff, um, you know, or afraid of assault. Um, the uh, the number of uh, of crisis calls has really really declined and that's uh, evidence of a real improvement in this population I mean, you can't take an unsheltered population that you know is unwelcome almost everywhere because they have complex problems like addiction like m- mental illnesses um, you know all kinds of trauma from living on the streets long term and expect them to have you know magically no problems the second you put them in a hotel what's kind of amazing and miraculous is how much they've improved. And so I think that the um, the agencies and the people that are trying to, um, to help these folks um, would say that, you know, there's been a dramatic improvement, you know, and, and the fact that, it, that this is happening in Renton is going to mean perhaps that, 
there needs to be more of an emergency response and more investment in emergency response. Um, and I think that's a legitimate debate to be having, but I don't think that the starting point for the debate should correctly be, let's just kick all these people out and make them go back to downtown Seattle. Right. And now there, there's something in the legislation that actually has like a geographic or distance restrictions between how far apart shelters can be. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So as I mentioned, it's done through zoning, um, which is kind of an unusual way of, uh, of doing homeless shelters, but it's pretty common in suburban cities that don't want homeless shelters. Um, so this is modeled on a Bellevue uh, law, which has resulted in zero homeless shelters in Bellevue. And also I think on a Puyallup law. So basically it says, among other things, they have to be half a mile apart and none can serve more than a hundred people. Um, which is a very, very small number when you're looking at a homeless population of 15,000 people or so in King County. So the effect of that, and then there's other zoning rules that say they can only be in certain kinds of industrial and commercial spaces. And, you know, it all, the effect is all to just whittle down, whittle down, whittle down the number of places where homeless shelters could even conceivably be. And then you have all these other requirements that are, you know, um, behavioral mandates on the people who stay at these, uh, at these places or use the services. Um, and the effect, according to the people who actually provide these services, um, is that it's, it's essentially a ban. Um, there, theoretically, you could have a very small homeless shelter, you know, in an industrial area serving a tiny percentage of people, but the number of restrictions that would be placed on it and just kind of the cost benefit ratio to a homeless service provider with very limited resources to provide this sort of stuff would be, you know, well, it just makes more sense to do this somewhere else and serve more people. Right. Uh, I know homelessness is complex and we probably don't even have enough time today, tomorrow, the next day to talk about all the issues around it. But one of the things we clearly we talk about is services. People, it seems like maybe you can give an indication of how big is the gap between the actual amount of people or the need and the services that are provided and services in totality, uh, you know, between government, between private organizations. How, how wide is the gap? Well, I don't, I can't put a number on it, but you know, it's, it's certainly billions of dollars and it's certainly, you know, at least I think the last count was seven, some thousand people just counted in January living on the streets. The real number is obviously much higher. So <clears throat> anybody who's living unsheltered is not being served. Um, people should be able to have a shelter or um, ideally housing situation that is appropriate for them. So all of those people, I would say, you know, are virtually unserved, even if they are using some aspect of the homeless system. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think you or I could go down the street, you know, right now and walk or drive and see tons and tons of people who are living in tents in horrible conditions, which is absolutely unacceptable in, you know, 2020 United States. So while I can't put a number on it, I mean, you can, you can see it right now because it's incredibly visible because we aren't, um, you know, Cal Anderson sweep tomorrow aside, we aren't uh, removing people as much as we used to. So um, the problem can really be seen in a, in a visual way. And I, I think that's also why we're seeing so much pushback, you know, not just, uh, you know, I don't want to dump everything on Renton and the suburban cities, but also in Seattle, there's a ton of pushback to, you know, somehow disappear homeless people um, without actually spending the billions of dollars it would cost to house everybody and provide treatment, and provide mental health care. And, you know, I mean, it just, the list goes on and on of what we should be doing and aren't. Right. And we talk about that. Yeah. T tomorrow there's supposed to be a, a sweep there in Cal Anderson and we see visual homelessness here all around Seattle. Can you, um, what's, what's the, the larger temperature around homelessness now in, in Seattle and, and this, as far as city government, What's what's city government's overall position? Do you think towards towards homelessness? We we hear more of a louder voice now. Um, we see documentaries really, you know, highlighting homelessness as a major issue here in Seattle. But I mean, from your opinion, where are we at a, in, in, as a city around the issue of homelessness? I mean, I think it depends on who you talk to. I think um, there is a real sense of urgency uh, at the the city government level to actually try to start doing things. I think you you saw that this year with the um, abolition or the, you know, whatever the, the 
um, dismantling of the navigation team, which uh, removes encampments or removed encampments um, and funding for, you know, some number of 300 new um, and temporary hotel rooms for people. Um, so there's there's some urgency around it. On the other hand, I think there is, because it's so visible right now, I think there is a real pushback. And I think that's why you saw Seattle is Dying Part 2 this weekend and um, and why you, you see so much sort of blaming in particularly in the right wing media, but just um, among people in the public in general, public comment. Um, you know, it's the, the problem is that um, it. it, it and it always has been, but the problem um, that people who are frustrated with this often express is that uh, we don't want to see this, and um, as opposed to we don't want this to exist. And um, and I think that's I think that's the real tension, and always has been, but it's really coming to a head right now with um, with the fact that tents are just filling up public spaces the way they are. I mean, it's bad. Anybody can see it's bad. It was bad before, but now it's visibly bad because we're not yeah. sweeping it under the rug as much. Right. Um, moving into 2021, what would you like to see if, if you had the, the magic wand? Um, what kind of actions would you like to see the city and the county take in regards to homeless issue? Well, I think if we're going to have a regional approach, which we've said we're going to do, um, you know, so let's start there. I think that there has to be um, there has to be some consequences for cities that say we want to be part of this regional effort and then um, who refuse to participate in the regional effort. Now, I, I'm not smart enough to know what those consequences should be, but we have a regional agency that 30 some odd cities insisted on being a part of. Um, they don't pay into it in any way, um, but they are a part of it. And if they want to be at the table and making these regional countywide decisions, they need to give a little. And I think um, passing zoning laws that ban homeless shelters and saying, you know, we don't want to pay this tax to help the most desperate people, um, there should be some consequences. And I also think, you know, we need a huge revision of our spending priorities, not just at the local and regional level, but at the state level. Because um, as Jenny Durkin likes to say a lot, and as leaders before her um, certainly said too, you know, this is not even just a regional problem. And more importantly, I think um, the amount of money we can get at a regional level, even if we pass a, you know, a Seattle city income tax tomorrow and it's upheld and, you know, and all of that, it's, it's not going to be enough. So we need state dollars too. And that's to pay for, you know, primarily, I think, housing and then after housing, um, all the all the other things that people, you know, sort of need to to recover and um, and get back on their feet, and that's you know that's treatment, that's mental health care, that's physical health care. It's uh, it's a lot of stuff, and it costs a lot of money, and we've never been willing to invest in it. All right, Erica C. Barnett, editor of PublicCola.com. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Omari.